So what's the truth about making your first million dollars? I'm gonna give you eight rules of the jungle. I call it the jungle. I'm down here on my treadmill desk in the basement and people have been asking me to do these old talks where I just get in front of a camera and just talk for a long time. No flash, no pizzazz, no lifestyle stuff, no cars, just straight talk. This is basically, I, I did a tweet today, what I wish I had done, in, uh, they had taught me in school, but more importantly, I said, if I had control of my life, what, what, like, what would I have done differently? I'm gonna tell you, this is unrelated to what I'm about to say, but it's kind of a foreword to what I'm about to say, okay? And that is, number one, I would have started a business before age 12 with the encouragement of all the people supposedly around me, school teachers, blah, 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 the elders, you know, parents, everything. Number two, I would have traveled as much as I could going, you know, of course with a parent, but travel. This is, by the way, instead of school as we know it, okay? That's number two. Number three, I would have learned, a mu mastered a musical instrument, okay? Number four, I would have gotten a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt or MMA, some kind of thing like that. Um, what was it, number five? Let me just look here. Like I said, it's a little forward. Oh, I was learning four languages fluently. Basically, the school system is garbage, okay? People get mad when I say that, but I'm going to call a spade a spade. Now, I didn't have control of my life, and you didn't have control of your life when you were 12, so you got stuck with all this monotonous nothingness. So that's my foreword to the eight things, the truth about making your first million dollars. In that forward, if that had happened to you and I, we'd be a lot longer or a lot closer to our goals financially. Because as Warren Buffett says, the most correlated or causative factor in making your first million dollars is the age at which you start. So the first rule of the jungle, and I call it the jungle, by the way, because trying to make your first million, everybody wants to make a million. It's a jungle out there. Trust me. Um, I've made a million before, I've made 10 million, I've made 20 million, 50 million, you know, over, I can tell you it's a jungle. People are gonna come out of the woodwork. They're gonna come out of the woodwork. They're not gonna like you. They're gonna be envious. They're gonna call you out. It's gonna be some family members. It's gonna be some supposed friends. It's gonna be society at large. People get mad about this subject of money. Trust me, when I put my first YouTube videos out in 2014, I was like, or 2014, 2015, I was like, ah, oh, People will like to see the journey. Like I'm from like a mobile home. I spent most of my teenage years. People want to see the journey to a Lamborghini. Nope. Oh, it's a rental. Blah, 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 blah. Like, welcome to the jungle, baby. So, step number one, or rule number one of the jungle, because the jungle has different rules. Trying to make a first million dollars is, try, is different than trying to just lock yourself into a nine to five job like most of society. So, Number one, everybody wants to go through the jungle. So supply and demand says it's going to be hard. Rule number one of the jungle is everybody, and let me just give you this analogy of the jungle. So here's you today in my right hand. Here's where you want to go in my left hand. Here's the pot at, uh, you know, at the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So that's making your first million. In between there, there's a jungle. When I was 16 years old, I went to the Panamanian jungle. It's called the Darien jungle. At the time, it was considered the most dense jungle in the world. I'm not sure if it still is, but it's hard to go through. And it goes from Panama, and then there's the Darien jungle, and then there's Colombia. And they purposely have kept this jungle there because a lot of people wanted to go from Colombia into Panama, part of the drug trade. Now, that's a perfect analogy, perfect metaphor, for what I'm talking about. A lot of people wanna go across this, but very few do. And that's why I use the word jungle. It's not a playground out there. Okay, so step number one, you have to understand in the law of supply and demand, there's only so much money in the world, okay? And everybody wants it. There's no people. Look, every other thing you can bring up in life, people will turn down. So for example, let's say your goal is to get married and have two kids. There's millions of people who don't want that goal. Let's say your goal is to is a religious goal. You want to 
you know, you're a Christian or you're Muslim or whatever and you want to achieve spiritual goals. There's millions of people who don't have that goal. Let's say your goal is to run a marathon. You want to run the Boston Marathon. Complete it. There's millions of people that don't care. But if you say to people, hey, you want this lottery ticket? It's a million dollar lottery ticket. Everybody will take it. <laughs> Maybe one out of 100 million people will say no, but everybody will take it, which means it's more competitive than basically any other activity, any other goal you could have. Because money equals freedom for people. Money equals the ability to accomplish their other goals. So everybody wants money. So rule number one is it's a jungle because everybody wants it. And so if you think it's going to be easy, if you think it's a jungle with no thorns and no vines and no alligators <laughs> and no spiders that are all around ready to bite you. When I was in the Darien jungle, we took it took us about seven hours, I think, by canoe. We had a little motorized canoe to go down and we were doing dent. It was with the church when I was 16 and they, we, there were dentists with us and doctors and we went into a tribe that was still using bow and arrows. But I remember going that Darien jungle, going down the, the river. I forget what the name of the river was. Maybe it was the Darien. And there's definitely, I don't know if there were alligators or crocodiles, but there were things you didn't want to fall in that water. It was dangerous. It was hard. You had to keep your wits about you. That's the perfect metaphor. And a lot, the reason people are so surprised that most people give up on their way to making their first million dollars is they weren't expecting a jungle. They were expecting it to be like, oh, it's just part of life. Like, oh, I go to the gym. It's hard to get a six pack. You know, well, it's harder to make a million bucks than get a six pack. For every person who, has, for every thousand people who have a six pack, there's one person who made their first million. Okay, so what's number two? That's kind of a big picture. Let me give you a practical rule of the jungle for making your first million. And that is you should start with a service type business, service type business. Now, let me step back. So rule number two, I'm writing them down so I, while I'm on the treadmill so I don't accidentally jump, jump around here. Number two is, let, let me rephrase it. You need to pick well what you do. And I gave you a hint for what I consider well. Pick well what activity you're going to focus on as you go across the jungle. Here's you today. There's a jungle. The other side is your first million. Um, most people, what they do is they either try a nine to five job. I saw some YouTube video. Oh my God. It said, best way to make your first million um, drive Uber. I was going, yeah, that'll take about 18 years. Do the math on Uber. You're not going to make a million. It, it said, you know, um, save your money from your job. Save whatever, $2,000 uh, a year. I don't remember what it was. $2,000, $10,000. Invest it wisely. Put it in tax-free or tax-deferred retirement accounts. And in 40 years, you'll have a million dollars. Yeah, well, that's true. But in 40 years, with inflation, a million dollars is worth 200000 So it's stupid advice. Okay, it's stupid advice. So choose well the activity that you're going to undertake on your way to your first million. Because most things ain't going to cut it. Now, some people, I do a little show like a Shark Tank. It's actually this show that I'm doing now. I have different versions of this show that I'm talking about right to you live on right now. Um, and one of them is like a Shark Tank kind of show. And I have people put their business ideas and what they're working on. And we give away money and we vote on what's the best idea. Most people's ideas on how to get their first million is, is horrible. Either it's way too big of a stretch. Like they're going to, I'm going to build the next Uber. Okay, well, Uber is not a good first starting business to make your first million dollars. Even the founder of Uber, Travis, it was, that was his second real thing he focused on. He first built a business and I think sold it for like 10 million bucks. His second or third idea was Uber. So on your way to make your first million, you better choose well, because if you choose something that's too out of reach, odds are against you. And some people go, oh, you should shoot for the stars, Ty. Well, <laughs> yeah, but you should shoot for a star that you can get to because some stars are too far away. Study the solar system, st study the universe. You're not getting to some stars. 
not a, not in our lifetime until there's some kind of quantum leap ability. So you're not gonna odds are you're not gonna go from your first biz, business, uh, you know, to billionaire status. So pick well. Now some people think too small. They're like, okay, Ty, here's what I'm gonna do to make a million. I, my first million. I'm gonna launch a little. I'm gonna. Uh, right, what was this one person telling me? Oh, they had okay. They had this app. I'm not gonna say what it is because it'll embarrass them. But I'll just give you a <laughs> a hint. It was like underwater basket weaving app. And I said, that's too small. There's only like 30 people in the world who care about underwater basket weaving. So you can, you can choose too small or you can choose too large. So choose well what's going to get you across that jungle. And my suggestion, practical suggestion, is you start with a service business. You don't start with an app. You do not start with something that takes a lot of capital, even if you could borrow it. Even if you could raise VC money, start with a service business. So what are service businesses? What do I mean? Well, before the internet, a great example would be like a dog walking company, right? And then you get a couple dog walkers under you and you get a reputation in your neighborhood. And next thing you know, in the city, I used to live in Raleigh, North Carolina, let's say a smaller city, you have 10 people working for you and you're walking 200 dogs a day. Each person walks 20, you walk a few, and you have people under you. That's a service business in the old school before the internet. Or another one would be like a, a personal chef or a personal trainer. These are all service-based businesses, right? You don't need a lot of money to become a personal trainer. You get a certification, or some trainers don't even have a certification, and you sell your time. So service businesses, you're primarily selling your time. Dog walkers selling your time. You could scale the business a little bit by getting other dog walkers under you. Car wash, mobile car wash. There's some people that wash my cars. They build a little service business. They're selling their time. They're like, hey, I, the owner, along with two assistants, will show up at your house and will wash your cars. I have like, they've been washing. Now I have like five, four or five cars at that house. But at the peak, I had seven cars there. So they would come. I forget what I'd pay them. But they probably make a 1000 or 1500 bucks. Just doing that. They sold their time. So service business is the essence service business selling your time. Um, so those are kind of old school, traditional. Those have been around for 50, 100 years. Mowing people's grass. In Fast forward to today, I suggest you build an internet-based service business because you can scale it. You can reach people quicker. You're not limited by your own neighborhood. So the best service businesses are the ones, if you've, if you've seen my ads all over the internet, they've been advertising, start a social media marketing agency, start a uh, home sharing rental, uh, a sh home sharing ma management company, HSMC, where you use like Airbnb, you put people's houses up on Airbnb and you split the profit 50-50 from people Airbnb in their properties. You don't even have to own the land uh, or own the real estate, I should say. Um, another one is an e-commerce agency or an Amazon agency. You help people put who have an existing business, you sell your time and you help them sell on Amazon. A lot of people who are business owners do not know uh, anything about the internet and they don't want to learn. The average business owner is over 50, 60 years old in most parts of the world. So if you know a little about the internet, you can sell your time as a service provider in a way that's much more likely to make you six figures at least. So you can charge them. Anyway, I have a whole course for that. If you go to my website, you can see that's not what I'm here to talk about. But I just want you to know to get across the jungle, most people don't choose well. And therefore, they have no chance before they ever started. Really, they got no chance. I see people and I feel bad. They're on there like, ah, I'm going to make my first million. I'm like, you didn't choose well. It's a little bit like... Well, one of my mentors, Dr. David Buss, said, I, I've never been married, but he'd been married, and he's spent 40 years studying psychology. He's one of the most respected psychologists who taught at Harvard and wrote all the textbooks used at Ivy League schools. And I just said, give me one piece of advice you've learned about marriage and dating. He said, choose well. He said, all the stuff about, you know, how to revive and fix a bad marriage or fix a bad dating relationship by going to therapists and practicing meditation together and all these things. He's like, better than all that is just choose the right person. And then you don't have that headache. Same with the rule of the jungle, the law of the jungle to get into your first million. 
if you choose the wrong person, you're going to spend all your time fixing and putting out fires. Or you're going to just limit. There's not enough market. Like I said, the guy, this guy did a million dollar app into something as stupid as like training people on how to do underwater basket weaving. It's got to be big enough, but not too big. So choose well. I could do a whole nother talk on that, but I gave you three. I think the three best opportunities right now is a social media marketing agency where businesses pay you one to $10,000 a month. It's Airbnb where you use Airbnb, you find real estate homes for sale or people who have an extra vacation home, you go up to them say, these play properties you own are just sitting, ma'am, sir, I'll put them on Airbnb. I can generate an extra two to $10,000 a month. I'll manage the people and I'll split the money with you 50-50. So you start generating for yourself three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month there from a service business. And then as I said, Amazon, another service business. I'm not necessarily saying you should sell on Amazon. As an e-commerce provider, you should help other businesses do it. That's as more like, like as I said, a service provider. So those three real practical ones that you can do that I've seen people start in over 100 countries. I've, I've had over 280,000 people go through my paid programs uh, with in-depth training on these. And it like it, it works. It Trust me, it works uh, for the people who actually do it. Okay, so after you pick well, pick the right idea pick the right business what's the third rule the third rule is um there you have to have thick 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 skin i'm talking to the point where you know how like you have calluses on your feet and they don't even necessarily look that nice okay that's how your whole mindset will have to be on your way to making your first million dollars because let me just give some examples of things that will happen to you on your way across the jungle to make your first million. Family member will betray you. Most likely, I see it six or seven out of 10 times. Somebody, I'll give you a public example, Dane Cook. You may have heard of Dane Cook, the comedian. At one point, he was like on top of the world, you know? And then he had his brother managing his money or his half brother or whatever. And, it, and now that half brother's in prison because he stole... I think over $10 million straight out of his bank account. You know, the person you thought you could trust, your own flesh and blood? No. Out there, you're on your way to making a million bucks and somebody's on the way to steal it. And so I saw a little interview. I don't know Dane Cook, but I saw a little interview where he was talking about how it, it you know, made him, I don't want to say the word depressed, but something like that to the point where maybe you don't want to proceed. And I'm telling you, when that first betrayal comes, you're going to have to have super thick skin to the point where you're just like, oh, yeah, I was expecting that. I'm good. Someone took, I'm on my way to making my first million. Someone took, stole 200000 from me. Good. I'll, just, I'll make it up. That's the thick skin you need. And you ain't going to make it. I have a guy, a, a sales team, and I have a new guy that started with me. And yesterday, it's just yesterday, he called somebody. They said, yes, I want to buy what you're selling. So, But the guy said, I'm a little busy now. Can you call me back in like three hours? So my staff guy called him back in three hours, and the guy just blew him off. Didn't answer the phone. Then he called him back again, and the, the, the customer on the other end was like, well, I'm kind of busy right now. And my staff guy got really mad, and he's like, Ty, I'm thinking of sending him a nasty message. And I just said, I said, welcome to the jungle, baby. Welcome to the jungle. People say one thing and do something. I said, is this really going to... Because he was all thrown off. You could tell. He was writing me this much on <laughs> WhatsApp, writing me this long message. I said, you want to make a million bucks? You want, you're on your way to your first million working for me? Uh, you literally are bent out of shape by this teeny little thing? This is teeny. No one even stole anything from you. You just had to do an extra phone call. But... In this world we live in, people are getting weaker and weaker willed. It's true. As uh, one of the greatest thinkers, I think, the wisest person I've ever read, Will Durant, who won a Pulitzer Prize, he's dead now. He said, nations are born stoic and die Epicurean. And this modern Western world we live in, even the world a as a whole, because we've become wealthier as an entire global civilization, 
were born stoic, meaning the original people who founded the United States or whatever country. These were people like with axes and chopping down trees and building log houses and surviving winters and almost starving to death. They were stoic. That's what was stoic. They could, they had thick skin and no matter what came, they just went right through it. Bullied their way right through the snow. Just, boom, I'm going. Okay, I'm hungry. We're just going to go to bed on empty stomach. Well, now what the word Epicurean means is lover of pleasure. So nations are born stoic and die Epicurean. I'm seeing a consistent pattern. I reach over 100 million people a year. I see a lot of people trying to make their first million or whatever it is their goal. And I see them getting thrown off by the, the smallest inconsequential thing. And I go, welcome to the jungle. I don't think you're going to make it. I'm going to bet against you. The first thorn bush that you bumped into that scratched you just a little bit, maybe even draw blood, you're sitting here like, oh, I got to stop. Come on, guys. Give me, a, give me an hour. I need to patch myself up. Oh, okay. This is the jungle. That's nothing. That's child's play. One of my favorite stories is uh, Shaquille O'Neal and Akeem Olajuwon, two very famous basketball players. And when Shaquille O'Neal came into the, the NBA – become a pro basketball player he was used to being the biggest strongest toughest guy he was over seven foot tall if you see Shaquille O'Neal when he was in college and first year in, ba in pro basketball he was an amazing like just one of the strongest people ever to walk this earth trust me in terms of athleticism uh Kobe Bryant said the strongest person I've ever met is Shaq Shaq in his prime and so Shaq's used to just bullying people around on the basketball court all the way from junior high, high school, college. He played at LSU. Now he's in the pros. Even in the pros, there's an interview with Shaq. He said, I used to just throw one elbow at the beginning of the game just to set the tone and show people who was the boss, the king of the jungle. Well, he said the first time he played the Houston Rockets, I had this guy, Hakeem Olajuwon, who was an immigrant, came from... I think he came from Nigeria, came from Africa, wasn't quite as big as Shaq, but he was a big guy. He's like 6'10", right? Big guy. And Shaq goes, I think it was a playoff game or an important game. They're playing, they're playing, they're playing. And Shaq is being guarded by Kim Olajuwon, and he goes, I just want to show him who the boss was. So he said, I threw an elbow and hit, Shaq, uh, hit Akeem Olajuwon right in the square in the chest. He said, anybody I'd ever done that to pretty much was intimidated for the rest of the game. So he said, I threw that, I scored the goal, and as we were running down, Kim Olajuwon just came up next to me and just went, because he has this deep voice, he, he, he went, <laughs> good one, little man, and just kept playing and totally psyched Shaq out. He said, I threw my strongest blow at this Kim Olajuwon guy, and it didn't even phase him. He thought it was funny, and that's the attitude you need to make your first million to get across the jungle. When someone throws a blow to your chest, figuratively, hopefully not, you know, actually, but they throw a throw something at you, you're just like, ha ha. You do that to people, people get a little freaked out, and you make it through the jungle. You find me somebody who the first little thorn, like maybe your first business idea is going to fail, and you're going to lose six months of your time in ten thousand dollars. Or maybe 50000 The first person just goes, ha ha, good one. Now I know what not to do next time. That's the person I'm betting on, okay? So rule number three of the jungle is you better have thick skin or you better not enter and just be happy with a nine-to-five job. There ain't nothing wrong with a nine-to-five job. There's nothing, nothing that makes a millionaire a better person than... You know, somebody, I, some of my favorite people on earth are Amish people. I lived with them for years when I was young. And they make a lot of make $30,000 and they're nicer and greater in my mind, my estimation. I like them more than 99% of people I meet who make a million dollars. So this is not a judgment call. I'm just saying, if you are one of those people called to be a business person, an entrepreneur, someone who makes money. And I do believe it's a calling. I don't believe it's for everybody. It's just like not everybody should be a doctor, but we do need a lot of doctors. Not everybody should be, you know, a carpenter, but we need a lot of people in construction. Well, same with entrepreneurs. 
Entrepreneurs can do a lot of good in the world. Look at people like Elon Musk coming up with innovative ideas around clean cars and clean transportation and solar power and all that. Government ain't going to do that. It's going to be entrepreneurs. Okay, so what's rule number four of getting across the jungle? And that is you better be a master of time management. Time management. Uh, I recommend you read a book by Harvard Press called... Uh, Managing Oneself by Peter Drucker. In fact, you can just read the first five, six pages. It's a small booklet. I've been recommending it for years. I should have gotten a cut from all the... (laughs) Harvard said I've sold more copies of their Harvard Press books, I think, than anyone. But I didn't get a cut on most of the people who got it, but I'm happy for you to read it. I don't have to make money off everything. Um, I just like to recommend that book. And in, in the beginning of that book, he says, look at the great geniuses or the great accomplishers, quote unquote, of the last 500 years, Leonardo da Vinci, right? Albert Einstein, Bach, the musician. Same 24 hours as the most unproductive people on planet Earth. So you better become a master of time management. That is a rule of this jungle because the jungle, the sun sets and rises And you got a minimum amount of time to get across this jungle. You don't want to spend too much time in the night in the jungle. Well, on your way to making your first million, um, you don't want it to take 50 years. Because making your first million in in 50 years, (laughs) there was a guy, Mr. Beast. He's one of the top YouTube influencers. I think he's the fastest growing channel on YouTube. And uh, he told me, he's like, I don't know. I want to make money now. He's only 20 years old. He goes, I want to make money now. Like, what's money going to do? It's not going to be fun to have money when I'm 93. So that's what I mean. This jungle, the sun goes up and the sun goes down. And if you don't manage your time when the sun's up, you get stuck in a dark jungle. And you don't want to be in a dark jungle. And to me, the dark jungle represents being 90 years old. A lot of billionaires on the Forbes list are very old. And that's great. I'm happy for them, but wouldn't you rather have, what would you rather have, a million dollars at 20 or 25 or a billion dollars at 100? My grandma's 101, so it's realistic. She could use a billion for something, but I don't know what she'd use it for. If you got a million in your 20s, you can invest in pretty much be set for life if you're smart and frugal a little bit. So the point is here is that time management is one of the essential criteria that people don't really get. Like people who talk to me about making money are like, yo, Ty. I mean, they kind of get it. They ask me about daily routine. But their real thing is like, how do I market this idea? Or how do I build this app? Or how do I raise a million dollars from Kickstarter or a venture capitalist? And I'm going, yeah, but how's your time management right now? Because most people's time management sucks. So let me give you a few thoughts and things I've learned. I've tested many things. I, I want to be known as a mad scientist. I think I already am a mad scientist. I try everything. So I've tried the Pomodoro method. I've tried, you know, there's the 80. Pomodoro is a series of timers you set. You do like 20, 25 minutes. Then you take a small break for five minutes. And then you do I've done that. It's a very structured Pomodoro. There's a thing called the Pareto Principle. Tim Ferriss talks a lot about 80-20 rule. So his thing for time management is basically, you know, you focus on only things that move the dial and you let everything else kind of fall apart. Another book on time management, Gary Keller, The One Thing. He has this kind of domino effect time management. So he says you can't manage all your time. You can't manage everything equally. So you find the one thing in your life that you can push on. And when you push that domino, all the time management kind of falls in place. And I will tell you of all those different philosophies, there's other philosophies that I gave you four, the Pomodoro kind of method, the highly structured, the, uh, the, the Pareto, the Pareto, Gary, uh, Keller. And these are kind of similar the like highly focused kind of thing, the Tim Ferriss thing. Um, but there's different, I could go on. You can talk for hours. There's a book called getting things done. Very famous book. Uh, it's probably sold, I don't know, five, 10 million. He has this whole structure of you create. He's more of like, um, 
an organizational time management person. So he's like, you have file folders and you have your projects and you get things off your plate real fast and you drop a, you know, you, you create a product and then you, a project, sorry, and then you divide it up into all these tasks. Again, I've tried that one too. So I, I will tell you, there's truth to all of these systems of time management. There's truth to all that you can set up a highly organized structure where you, you I, I talked to Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example. I actually got to spend some time with uh, The Rock recently. Did a little charity thing. I flew over to England for his Fast and the Furious, the spinoff he's shooting, and I was on the set with him and had a long talk with him about books and, and protein and, and one of, you know, time management. I mean, The Rock and Arnold Schwarzenegger, they wake up, Arnold... I interviewed him in his kitchen while he smoked cigars at his house. And he told me, he's like, Ty, I wake up at four in the morning. I read for one hour. This is his current routine. It was a little different when he was younger. But then at five, you know, I think I eat. I think he eats and he rides his bike to Venice Gym. And then he works out. He has this whole structure, like the whole day structure. The Rock's very much like that. But if you look at the richest person in the world, just to throw a monkey in all these systems... Like Jeff Bezos, people asked him his morning routine, his time management in the morning. And he's like, my best management is like having nothing to do. I kind of sit around at home and I think and I daydream and I spend time with my family. And I don't get into the office till 10 in the morning. This is the richest man alive. So you could see there's different time management philosophies. And you can choose one that you like. Maybe one resonates more with your style. And I think it's kind of what you have to do. you got to find things that resonate. But what I want you to know is none of them are absolutely right. And that's hard for people because people just go, Ty, what's the one thing, time management, that will instantly make me really successful? And I'm going, well, there's my, my mentor, Joel Salad, used to tell me there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. It's kind of a... As I think back, I'm going, skin a cat. It's kind of a morbid metaphor. But what he was saying is there is no, uh, how about, uh, there's more than one way to shear a sheep. It's not so violent, right? Sheep actually want their, their, their wool shaved or else they get too hot. So if, if you're into animal rights, there's a metaphor that you can buy into. There's many ways. I actually, one of my jobs when I didn't have any money, I got stuck in New Zealand when I was traveling the world learning from mentors. I ran out of money. I had to shear sheep in New Zealand. It's a very hard job, but there's various approaches to shearing the sheep, okay? There's no one way. There's different people do it in slightly different ways. So the first thing you got to know about time management is there's no absolute rule. The second thing you have to know is you're just going to have to kind of flip a coin and pick one to try for a while. And the third one is experiment with many, many things. Do not listen to somebody who tells you, to be successful, you have to wake up at four in the morning. There's lots of people that I know that wake up. My business partner, you know, he and I combined have done over a billion dollars in online, uh, you know, in gross sales online. And he's very successful. And he doesn't like to do anything before like 1 p.m. He's like, Ty, I've always had my best ideas at night. So there's an example you could show counter arguments that to get across this jungle, yes, you have to know how to manage your time, but it's not always like just wake up early. That's an oversimplification. So what must you have with time manager? That's what I want to talk about. What If it's not these little things like what hour you wake up and if you work out in the morning or later or if you use a stopwatch to time yourself, what is actually essential that everybody must have in time management? And I'll tell you what I think it is. This goes back to Peter Drucker in the book Managing Oneself. The best time management is spending the majority of the day on the things you're really good at naturally. That is the best time management advice you ever heard and will ever hear. Not to sound cocky. So the reason Jeff Bezos, it doesn't matter for example, if he wakes up early or if he gets to the office early or whatever, is that because even when he's at home, he's working on his strengths. And what are his strengths? Well, the man's a visionary. I mean, he's one of the, he's basically the founder of e-commerce. In 1994, he quit his job making a lot of money in Manhattan, and he started a website in 94. That's a visionary. So as long as he spends... A lot of his day, 80%, going back to the Pareto principle, as long as he spends 80% of his day on his strengths, that's all time management he needs to know. 
For you, what are your strengths? Are you an extrovert or are you an introvert? Are your strengths engineering type, mathematical type, highly logical ones, or are they social? You know, you got to know that. So if your strengths, if you're an introvert, to be productive and to be good with time management, you should spend 80% of your day doing introverted things. Introverts are better at writing. Introverts are better at architecture, like not literally building buildings, but the architecture of ideas. There's a good book called Quiet, The Power of Introverts, meaning introverts can lock themselves in a room and think up good ideas and then build out a whole plan, a business plan. So if you are an introvert and you know you're great at, you know, sitting in a room and getting a lot of things done, the best time management is 80% of your day doing that. And if you're a social butterfly and you're great at sales and persuasion, you should spend 80% of your day out talking to people. And so what happens in our society, why everybody's all mixed up about TAM management, is they're minoring, they're majoring in minors. They're like, well, if you only kept a journal and da 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 da, and if you only woke up five o'clock in the morning, this this all protect all successful people wake up at five in the morning. Well, it's not true, but they they say like that. Successful people who get across the jungle to make their first million and more spend the majority of their day every day on their strengths and they maybe have a business partner that helps them with their weaknesses or they have an assistant that helps them with their weaknesses. But nonetheless, they get things done in their way, focused on their way. If you're an introvert, your way is not very social. Your way is not talking to a lot of people. Do that, that's good time management. Do that 80% of the time. Okay, so number four is Strength-based time management. That's what I call it. Okay? Strength-based time management. Most of your time on your strengths. It doesn't matter really if you start at 6 in the morning, 9 in the morning, or noon. I mean, keep it reasonable. I don't know that, you know, I don't know that waking up at 6. I once experimented a time in my life. I had an office in India. I was working with programmers, and I was waking up at 6 p.m., It's a horrible thing. Don't do that. It destroys your health. So within reason, most things people talk about with time management are basically irrelevant or non-factors in you getting across the jungle to your first million. But spending 80% of your day on things you're naturally good at, well, that's good. Now, some people, I can hear people saying, what if I'm not good at anything? Everybody's good at something, really. Never met somebody. Maybe some people's an empathic person. They connect with people. Well, okay. Do a lot of things that require that empathy be used. You can see with me, like I spend a good bit of my time. I've always been a public speaker, for example, even when I was a teenager. And I make more money when I gravitate and use my time management focus around public speaking. Now, instead of public speaking, I do more videos, which reach the public. In a much larger way than any stage I could go on, um, but as I do that, it gets me to my financial goals. And if I, there's been times in my life where I'm not spending enough time out, and lo and behold, I make less and less and less money. I'm not I'm not using my strength, public speaking, for example. Okay, all right, let's move on here. We got four left. Four left. Truth about making your first million dollars, eight rules of the jungle. (sighs) Number five, number five. Um, I got to talk about, and it's a little controversial, my take on this. We got to talk about hard work and hustle. Okay. Hard work, hustle, and grinding, question mark. So this is a little different rule of the jungle. This is like, do you need it to get across the jungle? Does it, is it real? Because a lot of people, this is the most common thing that you'll be told by your parents, your teachers, and society. You get what you want, you better work hard. So the question, rule number five is the truth about hard work, hustle, and the grind. And this is what I think is true, and it's very hard to refute what I'm about to say, even if you don't like what I'm about to say. Hard work 
does not get you across the jungle alone. So just focusing on hard work will not get you across the jungle to your first million. There are literally a billion people or more in this world working hard every day. I've been to India. There's people working for $14 a month picking up trash 10, 12 hours a day. Okay? Do you think they're on their way to making their first million? No. They're stuck in a system. They're stuck in a poverty cycle. They're stuck in a, in a very, what's the word we want to do about India or Bangladesh or many countries? Um, lopsided, we'll call it. Now, it's getting better in some of these countries, but you can't just tell these people, oh, work harder. Hard work will get you to first million. But that doesn't mean hard work's not important, okay? It just means hard work is misunderstood. So here's the way to think about it. It's very simple. I'll tell you a story. Never found out if this story was true. My mentor, second mentor, Alan Nation, used to tell this story all the time. He said, a plane crashed in Colombian jungle. Speaking of, he literally used this jungle analogy. Maybe that's where I got this rule of the jungle thing. So, a, uh, a plane crashes. Boom. It's full of engineers going to an engineer engineering conference. And these engineers were hardworking. They were sharp. So, no one's killed in the crash. They know they're only about 25 miles from help, but they're in the middle of the jungle. Luckily, there was a whole bunch of machetes because they're in a thick jungle, crashed. They find the airplane was prepared for just a moment like this and had put 50 machetes in the storage bin. So they pull the machetes out and they go, we're going to get help. You guys stay here. There's a few injured people. You guys stay here. So they go, and they're very, they're engineers. So they're hard workers. They look at each other, they go, before we go, let's do a little five minute exercise on how to properly chop your, with your machete. So they like 45 degree angle, and you gotta work hard, and you have to swing at least 100 times per minute. To, and so they just went and they did all this. Hard working people, very precise. And that represents most of society. Hard at work at their job. Your parents probably were hard workers, okay? Grandparents probably were too. Maybe you are. But maybe your grandparents and your parents never got through the jungle. They never got to the first million. And here's why. One person who was on that plane was not an engineer. And that person crawled up a tree while everybody else was out chopping their way to help. And this person yelled down at him. He said, hey, guys, I got bad news for you. I got good and bad news. The good news is you're doing a great job. You're really hard workers. You're really making progress headed to the north. I mean, you're making a line through the jungle. You're opening it up with your machetes. You're going to cut 25 miles in no time of path. But he said, the bad news is you're going the wrong direction. Help. I can see it. It's to our south. You guys are chopping to the north, baby. I can see help. I'm climbed up this. I uh, climbed up this tall tree. Help is to the south. And everybody was mad down there. They're like, "Ugh, who is this person making us feel like we wasted our time?" Well, that's the perfect metaphor of what we have going on here. What's going on here is that you have been trained by society with to be a robot. You work hard, get a college degree, go out into the workforce, show up to work, be loyal, blah, 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 and you're going to get financial security. Maybe in the 50s that worked. It doesn't work anymore. Doesn't work anymore. Probably didn't even work back then, but definitely doesn't work now. You have to be smart. This goes back to rule number two, pick well. So if you're one of those people that have been indoctrinated on these, on hard work, let me tell you where it is true. So if you're going in the right direction, then you need hard work. You see, once you get the right business idea, once you start getting wealth coming into your bank account, then you want to turn on the hard work button. It's almost like you need two buttons in your brain. You need the experimenting, find the smart answer part, and then you need 
once you've locked that in, you need the turbo hard work mode. The problem is society only teaches you the hard work mode because in many ways our, our system is set up to make you an automaton, to make you a, if you look at our modern school system, it was really came about uh, during the time in the late 1800s, Germany, you know, you had, you had an industrial complex that Germany created under the Kaiser. You see it in World War One and World War Two. It created soldiers. It created factory factory workers. Everybody fell into line and was disciplined. And you weren't supposed to think about what the right thing was. You weren't supposed to. You weren't supposed to work smart. You were just supposed to work hard on whatever the man told you to do. And that system has carried forward to this day. And so you're going to have to reprogram yourself to go, I only work hard once I figure out what actually will work for me. Okay? So this brings us to rule number six. You need to experiment ideally with, with uh, 12 things per year. 12 different ways to get across the jungle making your first million. So don't just go, Ty, I got a business idea. Just go, hey, Ty, I'm going to test this one business idea. One. And you do it for about a month. And if you don't just work hard at it, you test it. So rule number six is experiment at least 12 times before settling down with one business idea. The reason people go, Ty, I see you have all these different business programs on your site. Why do you have so many? Well, because not everybody wants to do social media marketing agency. Not everybody wants to do e-commerce. So I build as many programs as I can with realistic ways that I think people can launch their first, you know, their first entrepreneurial business venture. But I don't think that I'll ever find one program that everybody should do because people are different. Extroverts will do better with social media marketing sometimes because it's sales, for example. I find extroverts do a little better, although there are always exceptions to that rule. I know some insane introverts that make a lot of money in sales but my point being is you got to test 12 things the average millionaire has definitely tested three to ten different businesses look at ray uh not ray crock but look at colonel sanders who started kentucky fried chicken which now is i mean it's huge in china it's a massive multi multi billion dollar company there's a list there's a good book i think i have it on my website it's about it's an autobiography that Colonel Sanders wrote about himself. It's a wild book. He writes in the most uh, non-grammatically correct way possible. But who cares? He got to the jungle. He he got through the jungle to his goal. He, you know, it took him a while. So you probably don't want to do exactly like Colonel Sanders. But the principle was he tried a lot of stuff and a lot of things failed. He was a motel operator. He was a uh, oh, so he was <laughs> he delivered babies. He, he without a, even having a medical doctor. He fought in the Spanish American War, I think, which is crazy since that's like the beginning of the 1900. Or he fought Cuba or whatever. So he just tried all this stuff, and finally, what worked for him was better than his hotel. His hotel burned down. His motel burned down. What worked the best was just selling chicken on the side of the road who would have thought and i bet you if you could ask him he would have said i wish i would experimented faster so i want you to do 12 experiments it might take you a week it might take you a month it might take you a year it might take you a decade it depends on you but don't settle down on one thing why do i pick the number 12 there's actually science to this it's called the science of optimal stopping There's a whole mathematical, you can Google optimal stopping. How many things should you experiment before you just settle down? By the way, if you're going to argue with me on this or you think this is wrong, just think about marriage. Before you settle down marrying somebody, wouldn't you want to have gone on dates with 12 different people? If you marry the first person you ever meet, like maybe (laughs) there would, how do you know? You have no benchmark. You have no benchmark. So an optimal stopping mathematics the general rule, it depends. There's many facets to this math, but you could just sum it up by saying 12 is a great number. So try 12 things, and if they don't work, shut them down fast. I was reading an article uh, in an interview I was also listening to by Jeff Bezos, and he was talking about how 
at Amazon, they've tried many things. Things that have worked really well was AWS, Amazon Web Services, became a whole nother business around computing, cloud computing, which you would have never thought that would, a bookseller would also do that, but he experimented and it worked. Um, another thing that failed, he had some of the hardware, some of the, not the Kindle, but I forget, Fire or Stick or something. He was talking about the things that he spent a hundred million bucks on that failed. And for sure, um, Amazon has tested more than 12 things. By the way, Amazon is really smart. They let other people sell and they just watch what sells the best. So they let other people experiment and then they launch Amazon basic brands. Jeff Bezos is very smart. That's a whole nother talk on the advanced rules of the jungle. But just experiment with 10 or 12 ideas. Um, I told I had a talk like this at one of my com- first conferences at the Roosevelt Hotel in 2015. And there's two people in the audience, Samir and Juan. I'm still friends with them. And I just said, I was even more hardcore. I said, you should test 17 things a day. They were doing e-commerce, right? So it's easier to test. You can't do 17 different jobs a day. But with e-commerce, you could test selling toothbrushes. You can sell toothpaste. You can sell electronics. You can sell shoelaces. You can sell shoes and all this. And it took them six months of testing 17 things a day until they stumbled upon, I think it was women's clothing or something, that they ended up making like a hundred grand in one month. And uh, they've gone on to make, you know, more than their first million. But it came through the pro, they tested hundreds of things. And so the sixth rule of the jungle that a lot of people struggle with is your first idea is not going to be your best idea. It's just not. It's not going to be your best idea. So it's, so be okay with going on dates with different idea and be okay with not marrying everything you date in business and in romance. It's just a good rule. You can have 12 wives, you're gonna to go to jail <laughs> for polygamy. Okay, we're about done. We got two more. Cause I've been on this treadmill for a while here. I'm starting to get tired. Okay, rule number seven. You must know what motivates you. You must know what motivates you. And there's basically four things that motivate people. People do not like to admit this, but there's four basic human drivers. I've run this by a lot of smart scientists, people smarter than me, pretty much all agrees that this is a decent way to think about motivation. I had one person disagree. He thought there was five, but I think he's wrong. And other smart people agree with me. So the four M's of motivation know which of the four m's of motivation you are i was just on a i was on jake paul a logan paul's talk uh podcast and i did a little test and i asked him like what motivates you and i I gave him a series of questions and he answered he answered very honest i was impressed um he's motivated by the uh fourth m which most people won't admit to so here's the four m's if you want to write them down so the seventh rule of making across the jungle to your first million is knowing how to motivate yourself because or else as even if you have thick skin even if you're working on your strength you'll eventually just kind of go why am i doing this okay so the four rules of motivate uh, what motivate you believe it or not they're not all money related in fact only 25 percent of most of human motivation is money so the first of the four m's is money slash material things there is a part in most humans not all that we have inherited from our great 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 grandparents right through our dna that makes us have a certain level of materialism be very careful if you meet somebody that won't admit they're a little bit materialistic i meet people like that all the time i'm just an entrepreneur because i i care about legacy and i care about changing the world bs if you really did then great you'd be building your businesses and all the profit you took You'd be donating 100% of it or 99% of it, but those people don't because there's nothing wrong with having some motivation around the first M, which is money slash material things. The second one is mating slash love, okay? People do a lot of stuff. In fact, Dr. David Buss, evolutionary psychologist, he tells me he thinks all motivation is around this thing, And um, but we won't go into that. Number three is movement slash freedom okay people are motivated by more freedom they don't want to be tied down they don't want to be told what to do you see that even with little kids 
you tell them what to do and then they want to do the opposite. So that's deep in our psyche and our DNA. The fourth thing is mastery slash status. Some people just want to be known, you're the man, you're the woman. Like they just like acknowledgement from others. Again, nothing wrong with any of these four as long as they stay in balance. So here's a quick test. I'll, I'll allow you to right now write down which of the four M's motivate you because once you know what motivates you, just this happened to me recently. I know my M's. I know what motivates me. And I was, we're working on a big project. And, you know, now I'm focused on businesses, I think, that can make nine to ten figures revenue. So me and my business partner, Alex, we were working on a, about a $300 million deal. It ended up not going through, but we're trying to buy a $300 million company. We're putting all the pieces together, bringing in some private equity and hedge fund people to do it with us. And, and, and I'm not going through. And um, on the way, if it, I'm a human, you know, you start going, ugh, why am I even doing this? Why It was a pain in the butt and then it didn't work out. Well, I know my 4Ms and I just started envisioning what motivates me. So what motivates me, by the way, is the third M is my strongest. I, every one of us is some motivation with all four, but my strongest is movement slash freedom. And I just started thinking, well, Ty, the deal's over. It's time to travel. I travel to me. I, my grandma took me on a trip to Europe when I was 12. She's from Germany and um, took me to England and Germany when I was 12. We also went to France for a second. We got kicked out of France. I was 12 years old and my grandma was like 80 or whatever. And... Uh, this was back, like, France had this weird rule about HIV. If you didn't have an AIDS test at the time, you could not get in to France as an as coming from, we were coming from England on a boat, like a ferry across the channel. My grandma's like, uh, I'm 80 and Ty is 12. <laughs> we probably are not high risk candidate, candidates, but believe it or not, France set us back. So at that time, I've been to France since, but I wasn't able to go to France. My point being, my grandma put the travel bug into me at a very young age. And for sure, the main reason I've become an entrepreneur is because I love the freedom. I don't have, I worked a little bit as a nine to five job when I was 16 at, at, a, at a company called Office of America, like Office Max. They're, they went bankrupt years later, but I hated it. I remember looking at my watch every day. I'm like, oh, oh. And I remember thinking, this has got to be the worst life ever, where all you do is look at your watch. So my grandma had instilled this freedom thing at 12 by taking me traveling. By the time I was 16, I started to realize it. And, and then I, I got, for a second, I had a job where I had to wear a suit. Really hated that one. Um, had to set an alarm. I'm, I'm the kind of person, if I got to set an alarm clock, I am not liking my life. So recently, when this deal didn't go through, this $300 million deal, I just was like, well, just more time to travel. See, and I pulled myself right out of that doldrum. And since we're not taught in school what motivates us or we're made to feel guilty, we often can't drive ourselves through the jungle to get the reward on the other side. Does that make sense? And I'll give you an example. Hugh Hefner, dead now, kind of controversial. You know, he started Playboy. But if you look at Hugh Hefner, okay, he died with, I think, net worth of, 100, 200, 300 million dollars. Not the richest man ever, but I don't think his first motivator was money, material things. I think it was the second one, mating slash romance, obviously, right? That was his thing. And it wasn't just women, by the way. He was a very social guy. He had his friends and he would do parties and he would have them every Monday, all his friends would have game night and then movie night. So he was very, in that mating slash romance, I, I would put even social you know, not necessarily just dating and in love, but that was his motivation. So he didn't care to him. He felt like he won, even though Jeff Bezos had more money or Bill Gates. Hugh Hefner didn't care because he knew what motivated him. As far as I could tell, I, I got to meet him right before he died. His son, uh, I met, apparently follows my social media, Cooper, and, and invited me to the last Midsummer Night's Dream party there. It was kind of cool. The most interesting man in the world was there. It was an interesting group of people, including the Dos Equis, most interesting man in the world, uh, which I thought was funny. But he knew what motivated him, and he didn't really care that society said that shouldn't motivate you, you know? Um, so here's a little test we'll do, okay? 
to figure out which of the four M's is your strongest motivator, the strongest motivator. I actually, probably by the time you see this video, I have a quiz, a free quiz on my website. If you go to tylopez.com, there should be quiz and you click it and you check, you can click the four M's quiz. I've been working on building it. There was a few bugs in it, but maybe by the time I release this, you can take that quiz. So I'll do a quick quiz for you right now. If you have the choice between reading the richest person in the world, but you had to be celibate for the next 10 years, yes or no? You could be the richest man or woman on planet Earth ever, but you gotta be celibate for the next 10 years, the next decade. No boyfriend, no girlfriend, no dating, no kissing, nada. Nothing, no physical contact, okay? If you raise your hand, yep, I'll take the money and I'll go, uh, I'll date 10 years later, then I bet you one of your strongest motivators is the first one. If you go, no way in the world would I even do five years, then you're probably more motivated by mating, romance, love, social. Okay, so that's how you pick between the first two there. Let's take the last two. You got movement freedom and mastery status. Okay, which would you rather have? You could either travel the world freely, no agenda, just have just enough money to do everything you want, but nobody knows who you are. Nobody. Your Instagram followers, you have like one. No one really respects you. Nobody looks up to you. You go to speak at a conference. People are like, who's this person? I don't, they don't, no one cares. But you know yourself and you got a little group of friends and you're just enjoying life wandering. Or... You can't leave your city for the next 10 years. You've got to stay in one place, but you are the man. You are the woman. you got New York Times best-selling book. Your social media following is 20 million people. You know, you go places and you go to a nightclub and the doors open up for you. And it's like, oh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Come on in. You're loved by people. You're acknowledged. You're encouraged. Which of those two? But you can't travel at all. Or you can just travel and be a nobody. If you'd rather travel and be a nobody, then status is probably not that important to you. The fourth M is not that so important. You know? If you, this is what I said, Logan Paul is very honest. He said, no, I like, I like mastery status. I want to be known as a master. I want to be the biggest social media influencer and all that. And I, you know, a lot of people don't like to admit that, but a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people in this modern world, that's their primary driver. They care about likes on Instagram. Believe it or not, People think that that would be my big one because I have a big social media following. No, everything pretty much I do, the first M of money mo does not motivate me as much as people think. I know. My business partner, Alex, it's his only motivation pretty much. Um, and the last one, if I could be a nobody but have all the freedom, I would take that without a doubt. Um, so I would say mine is the second M and the third M, not the first and the fourth. Okay, that could be a whole nother topic, giving you an introduction to this deep psychology of what will motivate you to actually get to the other side of the jungle to your first million. Number eight. Number eight, number eight, number eight, maybe the most important. Uh, eventually, you got to find one idea and scale it through the roof. So let's talk about scaling. So number eight way... You've done your experimentation. You know what motivates you. you you're spending 80% of your day. You know, you understand that you've got to have thick skin. All these other things I've talked about. The last one is you've got to focus and scale. Okay? That's the fight. It's like you've made it halfway across the jungle, but that's not enough. The pot of the gold, you've got to be 100% across the jungle. And that is focus and scale. And this is a conversation how to scale what's making you money. You've done your experimentation. You've tested 12 things. You've found the one 12 things minimum, by the way. And you find it and you're going and now you got to scale it because a lot of people figure out how to make 100 grand a year. Very, not as hard as you think. Very, 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 very large percent of people who try across the jungle figure out how to make 100 grand. Million grand, a million grand, a million dollars is much more difficult. And it's because to scale from 100 to a million, it's a 10 times, right? It's a 10x scale, but it's actually takes more than 10 times the skill, okay? It's kind of like, 
to bench press 100 pounds, or let's say 50 pounds, versus 500 pounds, it's more than 10 times harder, okay? Because basically the entire planet could bench press 50 pounds. Um, but more, so let's say a billion people can bench 50 pounds, right? But a tenth of that can't bench 500 pounds. Does that make sense? A tenth of that, it's not like a bill, it's not like 100 million people can now bench 500 pounds. So it's more than 10 times difficulty to go from making 100 grand to making a million. It's not difficult, it just takes more than 10 times the skill, okay? It probably takes 30 times the skill. So to scale, the S in scale, I always think skill. Skillful people can scale. And so if you're stuck on your idea, whether it be e-commerce, social media marketing, if you listen to me and you got a service business, service business can definitely be scaled to a million dollars. One of the people who teach in my social media marketing agency, Joe Soto, he's got an agency that does over one million dollars a year. He does like one and a half million or something. So he's certainly scaled. I have a lot of people in my programs doing a hundred grand a year, but he's scaled and he definitely has more than 10 times the skill. So what you have to do is you have to focus on training a lot, okay? Like how do you get a black belt in jujitsu? It's more than 10 times harder from blue belt to black belt. Blue belt's a second belt to black belt is like 100 times harder. Higa Machado, who I trained under when I'm in LA, he said, Ty, I've, you know, I've trained whatever. Well, he said for every 250 people that he gives a blue belt, one focuses and trains long enough to get a black belt. 250 to one ratio. That's probably the ratio of people who make 100 grand a year who figure out how to get to the jungle to make your first million, their first million. It's probably 250 to one. And it's not because it's necessarily 250 times harder in the sense that you have to have a much higher IQ or you, you have to you know even have a better business idea. No, that's not it. You have to commit to train. So focus and scale comes from skill and skill comes from training. And this is a bizarre thing. Like any sport I grew up, I played on one of the top high school basketball teams, Enlo in North Carolina. And North Carolina is the biggest basketball state. I think it has the most people in the pros. Uh, Michael Jordan's from there. Jerry Stackhouse was in my league. John Wall's from the same league that, that uh, not the same year, but the same league. Um, and... We had drills. I mean, I went to a school. We had seven foot center. We had like a, we played Oak Hill. It was we and we trained all the time. But then I meet people in business, and I go, "Are you training?" No, no, no. I just do my business. I'm just like, oh, I'm like launching my. I'm like, where's your training aspect? Training is where a master or a mentor gives you drills to do. That's why I tell people to read a book because that's like a drill for business. People go, I don't need a book. I don't know. Well, what you're saying to me is, no, Ty, I can become a black belt without repetitive skills. You need repetitive things you do every day. A good place to start is read more. You're going to meet people that tell you, oh, I didn't need to read and I made a million bucks. Well, they're an aberration. They're rare. And there's usually a story behind them like their parents had money or gave them a business or something. Trust me. Let's go to the top of the Forbes list if you want to argue with me. The skill of repetitively reading different books on different subjects to fill up your brain with skills. I'm not saying only books, but I'm just using books as an example. Okay, richest person in the world right now, richest man, Jeff Bezos. Not only does he read a lot, his first business was Amazon selling books. That's how much he loves books. He like built his empire on books. And trust me, he reads a lot. There's a good book called The Everything Store about Jeff Bezos, and it talks about how he walks around with a copy of Made in America, which is Sam Walton's autobiography on how Sam Walton built um, Walmart. And Jeff Bezos has read it so much, the pages are falling apart. See, he trained to build skill. One of his training tools was reading. Okay? Second richest person in the world, Bill Gates. Bill Gates loves books so much that his wife... And close friend says he goes on vacations that he calls them reading vacation. He literally takes a vacation just to catch up on all the books. He'll bring 17 or 20 to 40 books 
And I'll just go on vacation for two weeks and literally just read eight hours a day. That was when he was running the biggest company in the world simultaneously. He still made time. So you're going to tell me Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates need books, but you don't? Third, Warren Buffett, third richest person in the world most years, depending on the year. Well, uh, Jeff Be uh, Warren Buffett says to this day, he still reads 500 pages a day, five days a week. He said at his prime, he would read 800 pages, sometimes books, sometimes newspapers, and he would also read annual reports. That's how he found good investments. So there you go. You don't always have to read books. Read magazines. Read long articles. Read newspapers. Uh, there was a time in my life, I'm not doing as much as I should, but I was getting, I, I subscribed to like 40 magazines and newspapers from around the world. Boy, that's good. I, in fact, I'm glad I'm doing this video. Just to remind me to get back on that train. I'm still subscribed to probably 10 different publications. I still spend over $30,000 a year on books over 3,000 a month. Like, so I'm, I'm not out of the game of training, but man, the more you learn, the more you earn. Because the process of reading, now I'll add to that watching YouTube videos. I go to a lot of conferences. There was a time in my life I committed to go to one conference a week. Now I couldn't keep it up. I wanted to do it for a whole year, but I did it. I probably went to like eight conferences in four months or something. It was a little bit too much. But boy, if I had started, I w it would have been better than me going to sixth grade or eighth grade or 11th grade it was like a waste. I should have been going to conferences, different ones, business ones, social ones, you know, or networking events. Like these are all training the mind to scale. You know, I scaled in 2014 on YouTube and video advertising because I was at some conference and someone looked at me. I don't even remember who it was. I wish I could thank him and said, Ty, I think you'd be good on YouTube. See, that wasn't even my idea. And since then, I've had almost, I'm at 1.9 billion minutes watched of my YouTube videos. That idea that I scaled with came from listening to other people. So I said books, newspapers, magazines, going to conferences and listening to speakers, YouTube videos, podcasts like you're on now, uh, paid courses, consultants. I pay I've got paid courses. I mean, I sell paid courses, but I also buy them. I buy, I've bought so many paid courses that aren't my own. Obviously, I wouldn't charge myself, but um, I pay consultants. I pay mentors. I've got people on the books that I literally pay every month just to be on retainer for me to ask them questions. People like Dr. David Budd, like I, I, I'm like, the president has 15-person 15, 15 cabinet. I need at least 15 advisors. So this idea of focusing and scaling most of, mostly will happen where you can go from 100 to a million by imagining your mind as a sponge and you're just absorbing, you're, you're putting yourself in a place to absorb more. Then the scaling comes naturally. People think scaling is very hard. It's not. It's a consequence. It's a repercussion of having trained correctly. Training brings skills, skills bring, bring scaling, effortless scaling, or somewhat effortless scaling, okay? So read more. Listen to more podcasts like this. Listen, watch more videos like this. Go to more conference, conferences like this. Hire consultants. Join masterminds, paid masterminds, free masterminds. I got a paid mastermind. It's twenty-five dollars or $50,000 people pay to come four times a year to a mastermind environment. People have come. I remember one of the first people who paid twenty five thousand. He had a business where they used helicopters to like spray um, agricultural crops, and he was there and he had paid twenty five grand. And he talked to me. He was going, "Oh, what should I do with my business?" And I gave him one idea on how to sell his business. I think he ended up he either sold his business or sold part of it. He made like two million dollars. So he invested in himself in the mastermind. I'm not even trying to sell you into my mastermind. I don't take that many people in the mastermind. But the point being, find stuff like that. Some of it, you're even going to invest time or money in building your skills. I had a ju my jujitsu. Uh, I had Julio Cruz here. He's a black belt in jujitsu here. I'm in New York. Um, and I was so busy, I paid him extra to come to my place and do a personal training. I, that's money. So, but that allows me to scale my health, scale my jujitsu skills, 
it's a con but he trained all we did was drill we did drills today we did drills on how to pass the guard better drills on uh variations on the kimura americana all these different locks in jujitsu but it, it's a repetition you just repeat 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 and over time next thing you know you're a black belt in making money and getting to your first million so with that said, I've been on this treadmill for 2.16 miles. I've been walking slow, so I am not too distracted. Uh, time management, by the way. Get yourself a treadmill desk. <laughs> Get yourself a treadmill desk. So I hope this has helped you. Do two things for me. I've done this for free for you. Do me a favor. Fair is fair. One, if you're on YouTube, leave a good comment. Not a butt-kissing one, just what you thought. What do you agree with? What do you need to work on most out of these eight things? Give it a like. Give it a share if you're watching on Facebook or whatever. If you're listening on my podcast, subscribe and leave a review. Subscribe and leave a review. Sometimes I see people like from, I don't know what's up with the Apple iTunes algorithm. Somebody left a negative comment like four years ago and it's still the first (laughs) review I see. I'm like, what's up with this? They're like, your audio quality wasn't good. I'm like, well... You get what you pay for, baby. You ain't paying nothing for this. Don't be complaining too much. Anyway, hope this helped. And uh, talk to you soon.